Good evening. I'm Jeremy Baskus from the History Department, and I have the distinct pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Sarah Snyder, who is a professor at the School of International Studies Service at, I should know what, where she's teaching, at American University. Um, Dr. Snyder received her PhD from Georgetown University, uh, taught for a while at the University of uh, University College London before uh, returning to America to teach at American University, where she again is now. Her field is, is US foreign policy. Um, she's the author of, of several books and a whole bunch of articles. I'd like to mention or read the titles of the books. I won't mention all of the many articles. Um, they include uh, her first book, Human Rights Activism and the End of the Cold War, A Transnational History of the Helsinki Network, published by Cambridge University. Uh, her more recent book uh, is titled From Selma to Moscow, How Human Rights Activists Transformed U.S. Foreign Policy. It was published in 2018 by Columbia University. Um, Dr. Snyder is also, importantly, the executive director of the Journal of Modern American History. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Snyder, who will give a lecture called When, How, and Why Has the United States Put Human Rights, quote, at the center of its foreign policy. So let's welcome. Thank you all so much for coming here this evening. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, one thing that uh, he did not mention is that Ohio Wesleyan has loomed very large um, in my family's history um, because my father, who is here tonight, is a graduate um, and so is very delighted that um, I was invited to speak here. So during his campaign for president, Joe Biden declared a commitment to, quote, putting human rights at the center of U.S. foreign policy. And so what I want to talk about tonight is when, how, and why has the United States put human rights at the center of its foreign policy? And I'm just going to start with a spoiler alert and give you my answers up front. So one, not that often. Um, throughout its history, it's true, right? Uh, throughout its history, the US government has largely been consistent in minimizing attention to human rights concerns in its policy formulation. Number two. It has usually pursued human rights uh, through unilateral measures. And number three, the two exceptions to this low level of interest have come when championing human rights aligned with the government's existing foreign policy priorities, or when non-governmental activists successfully pressured branches of the US government to take human rights violations into greater account. So with that said up front, I wanna to talk today about how we got to Biden's commitment and the degree to which it is unique. So I want to begin first by defining US human rights policy, which I see as the extent to which government officials take account of human rights violations when they formulate foreign policy. So within the framework of a human rights policy, US policymakers might weigh the human rights of other records of other governments as they assess, say, decisions on military or economic support, formal or informal alliances, or high-level visits. And when evaluating these human rights records of foreign governments, the debates have largely focused on civil and political rights, essentially the rights that overlap with the rights granted to US citizens by the Constitution. These are rights like the right to due process, uh, the right to freedom of speech, protections from religious persecution, as well as cruel and unusual punishment. Now, these determinations are premised on the idea that human rights are universal and therefore not limited by citizenship or country of residence. So what I'm gonna to do today is talk about what I see as sort of three distinct periods of US human rights policy. I'm gonna begin by talking about US efforts to create a human rights framework for the world after World War II and the challenges that the Cold War presented to a continued focus on human rights. Then I'll talk about how in the 1960s, US officials had a new approach to human rights. Um, I'll look at a broad-based movement for greater attention to human rights violations and efforts to address them through US power in the mid to late 1970s. I'll show how these efforts culminated to some degree with the end of the Cold War in Europe. I'll show how the US struggled to find a new organizing principle 
such as the containment of the Soviet Union for its foreign policy agendas in the wake of the end of the Cold War. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how US policymakers struggle to balance human rights and security in the context of the war on terror. But first, I'm going to start at the beginning. Because as early as Thomas Jefferson's 1776 Declaration of Independence, Americans had been discussing their rights and the rights of others. Jefferson wrote, quote, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, fast forwarding to the middle of the 20th century, during uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidency, his speeches also served to popularize the concept of human rights. For example, Roosevelt said, quote, freedom, freedom from supremacy of, means uh, freedom, means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. And people like uh, his widow, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, helps the United States play a significant role in shaping early human rights commitments at the United Nations. Now, US officials had begun working on an international bill of human rights as early as 1942. And as the US delegate, um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, made a significant contribution. She worked um, on the development of an international human rights regime. She worked drafting a document that outlined international human rights norms and protected international individual freedoms. And then finally, she also tried to work on um, gaining broad-based acceptance of these human rights um, sort of documents um, by the US public. And there, were, there was a kind of brief flowering of support for human rights issues um, in a much broader based way. But in the following decade, attention to human rights questions were overtaken by worsening Soviet American relations and the spread of anti communism. And it's here that I come to my first Ohio connection, uh, which I did not anticipate when I was working on this talk. Um, so it's in this context of the early Cold War that we have the Bricker Amendment controversy. And this really ended US engagement with international human rights for several years. Now, the Bricker Amendment was first proposed by Senator John Bricker, a Republican from Ohio, in September of 1951. And it was intended to address concerns that the president, uh, who was Eisenhower at the time, um, oh, sorry, uh, it comes in the Truman administration, but it really comes to fruition in the Eisenhower years, that the president might commit the United States to international treaties that would contravene the US Constitution. Explaining his rationale for pursuing this constitutional amendment, Bricker said in early 1952, quote, I do not want any of the international groups, and especially the group headed by Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, which has drafted the covenant of human rights, to betray the fundamental, inalienable, and God-given rights of American citizens enjoyed under the Constitution. The support for the Bricker Amendment was firmly rooted in opposition to human rights treaties and international institutions more broadly, a position that was shaped by anti-communism and Cold War politics, as well as desires to maintain racial segregation. Now, Bricker's amendment failed to gain the required support. Um, but because it was so salient, um, Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, uh, John Foster Dulles, decided that they were going to downgrade attention to international human rights. Um, and really throughout his presidency, they paid very little attention because they didn't see the issue as aligning with US interests. They believed it threatened executive branch power and it had very limited support among activists. And in the wake of this, um, when John F. Kennedy was elected, he tried to signal a significant break from the Eisenhower years. And he did this in a number of ways. First, he used the term human rights in his inaugural address. He declared that a new generation of Americans were, quote, unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and abroad. In terms of his policy, Kennedy submitted three United Nations conventions to the Senate for ratification. He paid attention to the plight of political prisoners in Cuba. He put pressure on the South Korean military leader to end military rule. He imposed an arms embargo against South Africa, and he worked to avoid a declaration of unilateral independence by the government of Southern Rhodesia, present day Zimbabwe. 
In these instances, Kennedy's efforts on behalf of human rights aligned with his broader foreign policy goals, which were primarily motivated by Cold War considerations. And to explain just one of these positions, um, signaling US opposition to racial discrimination, as he was doing with South Africa and Southern Rhodesia, offered the United States new opportunities for expanded influence in Africa. The Kennedy administration initially expected expressed its opposition to apartheid um, through rhetorical and symbolic measures. Um, for example, under Kennedy, the United States began integrating um, all of its sort of official uh, social and diplomatic functions um, at American facilities in South Africa. And this was quite controversial at the time. But ultimately, there was increased pressure on the Kennedy administration to do even more. And so at this point, in the middle of 1963, the US government decided that it would stop selling arms to South Africa because to continue to do so, to continue supporting the apartheid regime there was damaging its relations with all of the other newly independent black African countries. And so I think what we see here is that Kennedy's attention to human rights demonstrates the broader conditions, the Cold War conditions that were shaping US policy. Now in the middle of the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson made great strides domestically with legislation such as the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, but his attention to Vietnam really crowded out nearly all other issues, which meant that human rights rarely aligned with his foreign policy agenda. One exception was the US's response to the unilateral declaration of independence pursued by Ian Smith in Southern Rhodesia. And here, the United States decided to withhold recognition of the new government, and it stuck, undertook multiple steps to really convey the degree to which the United States condemned this action. But just as with the Kennedy administration, this was an effort that aligned with US efforts to appeal to newly independent African governments. Um, in contrast, when there was a coup in Greece in 1967, the Johnson administration rhetorically condemned this. Um, and it did inquire uh, with the junta about the fate of political prisoners that were of current, uh, concern to US um, officials. And it temporarily implemented an embargo against heavy military exports. But it didn't oppose the new military leaders, um, despite the flagrant attack on Greek democracy. And even this selective embargo um, against heavy, heavy military exports, which had been implemented in May of 1967, was later lifted because the United States was concerned about the military um, preparedness of Greece, which was after all an ally in NATO. Um, and so this was a very short term um, condemnation of the junta and a stepping back of that approach um, once Cold War foreign policy concerns began to take on greater weight. Um, moving forward to Johnson's successor, Richard Nixon, his administration confronted a series of human rights decisions in its first term due to growing congressional, diplomatic, and non-governmental pressure. But I would say that championing human rights considerations um, over other priorities did not fit with his conceptions of US foreign policy, nor those of his national security advisor and later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Therefore, when the Nixon administration had to make decisions, for example, should it continue the selective embargo that Greece had imposed on Greece, uh, that Johnson had imposed on Greece, um, it said, no, this is gonna weaken the NATO alliance and we don't wanna do so. So it resumed full military assistance to Greece, even though the military junta was still in power. Similarly, when Nixon had to decide, should it keep the sanctions that Johnson had imposed against Southern Rhodesia in place, it said, no, uh, we're not going to keep pursuing these. Um, and when Nixon was working on devising a policy of detente toward the Soviet Union, he chose to minimize concerns about Soviet human rights abuses and instead privilege concerns about arms control, trade, and other agreements with the Soviets. Now, many in Congress and many in the American public disagreed with these calculations, um, and they pressed the White House to champion the rights of Soviet citizens, particularly those of Soviet Jews who faced religious discrimination. Now, in the face of growing congressional and non-governmental pressure, um, Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, ultimately did sign legislation that included um, the 1974 Jackson Vanek Amendment that limited Soviet American trade, uh, given the restrictions that the Soviet Union had placed on emigration from the Soviet Union, which was seen as sort of disproportionately affecting Soviet Jews who wanted to emigrate to Israel. Now, as I mentioned, 
um, Nixon's uh, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, did not see human rights violations as something um, that were the subject of diplomatic negotiations. He saw them as internal matters in which the United States and foreign governments should not intervene. And given such priorities, he even admonished one ambassador um, who he thought was pressing the issue too forcefully to, quote, cut out the political science lectures. And this was in response um, to uh, concerns um, about the wide scale of repression in Chile in the wake of the September 1973 coup there that had focused many Americans, not just those in the White House, on human rights in the years that followed. Now, the Chilean case captured American attention in part because there were two American citizens who were murdered in the initial days of the coup. Um, but also, this fits within a broader framework of US leaders privileging right-wing um, violence over human rights in Latin America that was increasingly distressing to those who were following Latin American issues closely. And so what developed in the face of um, White House uh, resistance was an alliance between members of Congress. Um, here we have Tom Harkin um, with uh, Joseph Eldridge, who was the head of the Washington Office on Latin America, a very prominent non-governmental organization advocating for new approaches to US foreign policy toward Latin America. Um, but also people like Senator Ted Kennedy, a Democrat from Massachusetts, he attached an amendment um, to legislation in 1976 that banned the shipment of any US manufactured weapons to Chile, which in effect ended all military assistance to Chile. Um, I wanna emphasize that in each of the instances that I've been talking about in the Nixon and Ford years, whether it's this legislation that Kennedy um, passed or the jackson Vanek Amendment, um, each of the times that the, there was some forward movement on human rights issues, the United States was pursuing these sanctions in a unilateral way. It wasn't pursuing them through the United Nations or through multilateral approaches, um, and it only undertook these sanctions because it was under pressure from members of Congress and from the American public. So these are really the two forces, members of Congress and non-governmental actors that are pressing for attentiveness to human rights in the formulation of US foreign policy in the 1960s and the 1970s. And for me, really the key person here was um, Representative Donald Frazier, a member of Congress, uh, a Democrat from Minnesota, who began publicly questioning the morality of US foreign policy in the 1960s. And what Frazier believed was the Cold War framework inhibited consistency between American morality and the government's foreign policy. And his calls for greater attention to human rights were part of an effort to develop a new approach to relations with the wider world. He served as head of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations and Movements, um, and he organized a series of hearings in 1973 that ultimately resulted in pressure for the US government to take greater account of human rights as it formulated its foreign policy. Um, when he was talking about like, why did he decide to hold all of these hearings about human rights and why did he publish a report, which you can see over here, um, he said that what he wanted was for the United States to be consistent with its values. He believed that through the Cold War, US foreign policy had drifted too far away from the values and ideals that had been at its core previously. And so under Frazier's leadership, his subcommittee issued a report that advocated reorganizing the State Department to better equip it to consider human rights as an element of US foreign relations. And here there was executive branch responsiveness. The State Department, um, after the report came out, it designated someone in the United Nations Political Affairs Office to be in charge of human rights. Um, they appointed an assistant legal advisor on human rights, and they selected human rights officers that would serve in the regional bureaus of the State Department. The subsequent year, the State Department created a position called the Coordinator of Humanitarian Affairs that was supposed to coordinate human rights issues across the department. Um, so following the subcommittee's report, there were several key consequences for US human rights policy as members of Congress who were interested in human rights, you know, they sort of felt like, okay, some of the bureaucratic reorganization has been accomplished. And so then they turned their attention to trying to cut off security assistance to governments, foreign governments that they believed were violating the rights of their citizens. So first, 
um, Congress passed Section 32 of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1973, which said, quote, it is the sense of Congress that the president should deny any economic or military assistance to the government of any foreign country which practices the internment or imprisonment of that country's citizens for political purposes. Now, State Department officials were resistant to this. They said, you know, this is kind of a one-time thing. It doesn't really give the U.S. leverage over foreign governments, and there's no definition of political imprisonment. We don't really know what you mean. So Congress said, okay, you think that this is too vague. Uh, we, will, we will give you new legislation. And so what they did next was to pass Section 502B of the 1974 Foreign Assistance Act. But again, the language was not stringent enough, and so the executive branch was able to circumvent it. Um, they said things like, well, you know, these human rights violations aren't really rising to the level of gross violations, um, or if there are gross violations, they're not really a consistent pattern of human rights violations. And so between November of 1974 and November of 1975, no country actually had military aid cut off because of this legislation. So then um, Congress said, okay, well, we have a new answer. We're gonna pass section 301 of the International Security Assistance and Arms Export Control Act. Um, and this is what was the legislative mandate that said that the State Department had to assess and report on the human rights record of a country before it could receive security assistance. This is why every year the State Department does annual human rights country reports. It all comes out of this legislation. And beyond that, um, Congress passed what was known as the Harkin Amendment. Um, this is section 116 of the International Development and Food Assistance Language of the Foreign Assistance Act that similarly prevented the extension of economic aid. So before we were talking about military aid, this is economic aid to governments that engaged in gross violations of human rights, unless such assistance will directly benefit the needy people of such country. So finally, in the wake of this stricter legislation, the State Department and Congress began working together on successfully monitoring human rights. And this was really the beginning of sort of growing cooperation between the executive and legislative branches. And it's at this time when there's finally greater collaboration within the US government that you sort of simultaneously have the flourishing of a non-governmental movement for human rights. Um, human rights activist Arya Nair has said, quote, the overwhelming majority of the world's national and local organizations promoting human rights have been established since the last half of the 1970s. Within the United States specifically, this includes um, groups such as the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights, now known as Human Rights First, um, which was formed in 1976. In 1979, Helsinki Watch was formed. This is the precursor to Human Rights Watch. Now, the proliferation of these human rights groups in the United States and elsewhere was due in part to globalization. There were innovations in telecommunications and information technology that facilitated greater non-governmental activism on human rights, um, because human rights violations were much more visible in a globalized world but also things like the lower cost of international travel um, facilitated human rights activists' ability to travel, um, to engage in contacts across national or even east-west borders. Um, there were also new trends in the dissemination of information domestically and transnationally that also played an important role. This is also a moment in which private foundations, such as the Ford Foundation, um, we're increasingly supporting human rights activism financially, and this put more resources at the activist's disposal. Um, but I would say that even as these groups were growing, they had more resources, they had greater contacts, their power was still linked to the extent to which their concerns aligned with administration priorities. Now, Jimmy Carter's inauguration ushered in greater high-level attention to human rights. Carter championed human rights in his speeches, he spoke out about human rights abuses in places like Argentina, the Soviet Union, Uganda. Um, and in addition to this rhetorical focus, Carter also made personnel appointments that signaled a commitment to human rights, including naming uh, the first Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, um, civil rights activist Pat Darian. Um, he also famously exchanged correspondence with Soviet dissident Andrei Sakharov. Um, and soon after his election, Carter commissioned a review of the role of human rights in US foreign policy um, in order to determine how the government should respond to violations of human rights internationally. 
Um, this resulted in a 1977 Presidential Review Memorandum that delineated the administration's view uh, that there were three types of human rights that needed to be protected. One, freedom from government intervention. These are issues like wrongful arrest, torture, false imprisonment. Two, the right to food, shelter, medical care, and education. And then three, civil and political rights. And I think one thing that's really notable here is that there was a broad articulation of human rights, um, which represents an exception to the sort of narratives that during the Cold War, Western leaders ignored social and economic rights. In addition, uh, in this presidential review memorandum, uh, Carter's advisors also outlined um, what should the US human rights strategy be abroad. One, they said that they should emphasize American morals and virtue. Two, they should work to spread the rule of law. And finally, they should try to support and expand democratization efforts in places like the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. But they were careful to say that the Carter administration needed to be careful not to single out particular countries and to emphasize instead that this was a sort of global nature to their focus. Um, the memo signaled a shift in tactics and I think illustrates that the administration increasingly recognized that vocally supporting human rights in some instances was imperiling other foreign policy priorities, things like arms control agreements with the Soviets um, or other issues. And so despite this policy advice that the Carter administration needed to adopt a balanced global approach to human rights, many contemporary and subsequent observers have criticized inconsistencies in his approach. Um, similar to Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford, Carter was episodic in his protection of human rights internationally, and he often prioritized Cold War concerns. In particular, critics have charged that for geopolitical reasons, the Carter administration did not subject the human rights records of, for example, Romania, Cambodia, uh, Iran, South Africa, Indonesia, or China to sufficient scrutiny. And he had complicated relations with repressive leaders, such as the Shah in Iran, or Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua, um, which raised further questions about the consistency and consequences of his policy. Now, during the 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan had criticized Carter's human rights record. Um, and upon taking office, his administration said it was going to transform the US approach to human rights. Now, Reagan's argument had been that Carter's policy had neglected US national interests and it hadn't actually improved human rights. Um, in some, I would, but you know, there's a complicated record of each of these administrations as I think I'm trying to demonstrate. So in some regions, such as Central America, the Reagan administration justified devastating human rights violations in the name of preventing the spread of communism. But in other spheres, particularly if we look at his record in the Soviet Union and Poland, Reagan spoke forthrightly and repeatedly in defense of human rights activists and against repression in the Soviet bloc. And it's this rhetoric um, that's among the reasons that people point to Reagan um, as having some credit for ending the Cold War. And I would say that there are also a number of other cases, um, South Africa, the Philippines, and Chile, where Reagan's uh, stance evolved. Essentially, he was very slow to come to championing human rights, but ultimately did so, potentially maybe when the writing was already on the wall. Um, and I think the degree of credit that his administration is given um, for changes in these countries is often refracted through a political lens. Um, and that those who attribute great significance to Reagan's support for human rights in these cases often overlook the degree to which Reagan came late or unwilling to the cause, and also the extent to which he was under pressure from members of Congress or NGOs. So overall, I find Reagan's record very difficult to characterize neatly, um, which is why I often talk about it as a sort of compartmentalized approach uh, to human rights and why his policy remains so contested today. So now I wanna talk about human rights um, after the end of the Cold War. So the end of the Cold War in Europe ushered in a wave of euphoria about transitions to democratic governance um, and a belief that these new governments would respect human rights. And it seemed at first, as the political scientist John Dietrich has written, quote, that the end of the Cold War and other contemporaneous shifts appeared to finally remove all the long-standing limitations on US human rights policy. However, uh, this was not to be fully the case. Um, there were early signals that the United States had a new approach um, potentially to human rights. These included heightened rhetoric about human rights, increased humanitarian interventions, 
greater participation in international treaties, as well as legislation such as the Leahy Law, which prevents assistance to military units that commit gross violations of human rights. But in the end, trade, terrorism, and the weakness of non-governmental actors all limited the transformation of US human rights policy. The approach of the US government, which ignored human rights violations in places like China and Rwanda, um, and only acted in Bosnia when its reputation was threatened, showed that actually US foreign policy after the end of the Cold War was highly consistent with that which had pre preceded it. George H.W. Bush and his aides were less concerned with reforming human rights practices of communist regimes than their predecessors had been, and they prioritized and said stability over transformation. And for example, um, the Bush administration was very reluctant to uh, react to the brutal suppression of demonstrators in China's Tiananmen Square in June of 1989. In the aftermath, his objective was to disavow Chinese actions, but without sacrificing the overall Sino-American relationship. Bush decided, rather than targeting the Chinese government overall, that he would target the Chinese army um, with reprisals by suspending military sales and contacts. Many members of Congress and the American public, as well as international leaders, had hoped for much more far-reaching international sanctions. Uh, turning to Yugoslavia, um, as the country disintegrated in the early 1990s, uh, nearly 300,000 people were killed. But Bush and his advisors did not see ethnic cleansing in Bosnia as warranting US intervention. Um, in fact, after the outbreak of civil war there in 1992, uh, Bush's Secretary of State James Baker asserted that the United States, quote, did not have a dog in this fight. Now, the Clinton administration followed this policy. Um, it struggled to formulate an approach to Bosnia um, his Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, called it, quote, the problem from hell. Um, and only uh, did U.S. officials begin to focus more closely on what was happening in Bosnia in the wake of the murder of over 7,000 Muslims in the U.N. safe haven of Srebrenica in July of 1995. The following month, there was a devastating attack on a Sarajevo market that drew attention to Western inaction. And these two attacks made the United States and NATO look impotent. And it's only then that they decided to take more forceful action. And this is because the NATO bombing that, that came thereafter was seen as essential to maintaining NATO and American credibility. Ultimately, it pushed the warring parties to negotiate. And on November 21st, 1995, after 20 days of nonstop negotiating at the Dayton Air Force Base, my second Ohio connection of the talk, um, all sides reached a peace agreement. But shortly, uh, you know, at almost a simultaneous time, um, there were several months in the spring and summer of 1994, where in Rwanda, a small country in Southern Africa, um, the world's most staggering genocide since the Holocaust took place. As many as one million Rwandans were killed. Um, and although the United States undertook military operations to evacuate its citizens, it didn't take any action to intervene to stop the violence there because the Clinton administration did not see stopping the killings as aligning with its other priorities or national interests. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that the United States' hesitation here was shaped by the trauma of its recent intervention in Somalia, um, where 18 US soldiers had died. Um, but nonetheless, the Clinton administration did not act. Now, the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, shattered any remaining hopes that the end of the Cold War might usher in a new approach to human rights and US foreign policy. As the country came to terms with nearly 3,000 deaths, George W. Bush's administration developed a multi-pronged approach, which included a willingness, as his vice president Dick Cheney put it, to work sort of on the dark side. Therefore, under the second Bush administration, not only did human rights considerations not figure prominently in US foreign policy, but the United States became a violator of human rights as well. As part of the administration's response, the Office of Legal Counsel determined that the Geneva Convention protections did not apply to the Taliban, to Al Qaeda, or to other terrorists who were held in captivity. They were instead so-called unlawful enemy combatants and not prisoners of war. Therefore, the United States subjected these suspected terrorists to, quote, extraordinary rendition 
which meant transferring them to foreign governments, including those that were known to torture suspects. Um, they also sent them to secret prisons, often referred to as black sites. Interrogators at the U.S. detention facility in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, were given permission to use enhanced counter-resistance strategies that included methods such as waterboarding or the use of a wet towel and dripping water to produce the um, perception of suffocation. Now, the lack of due process accorded to the detainees at the base, the use of torture against these prisoners, and the indefinite nature of the, of the detentions made the prison a target for human rights activists, legal scholars, and critics of the US war on terror. In 2014, the Senate determined that 39 detainees had been subject to torture, that the use of these interrogation techniques did not uh, produce intelligence that averted terrorist attacks, and that torture instead had led to false confessions and inaccurate information. Now, shortly after his inauguration, Obama and his aides pronounced a number of new policies, including the closure of the CIA's secret prison system, a commitment to the Geneva Convention, adherence to the military's interrogation rules, and a promise to close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. Now, as you know, Obama did not succeed in closing the prison, and his failure to end these detentions at Guantanamo Bay was one of a number of uh, reasons that Obama's record led some disappointed observers to charge that his approach to human rights represented a rhetorical change, but not necessarily a change in reality. And I would say that the um, expansion of the US drone warfare program under Obama, which led to the deaths of many innocent civilians over his two terms, only further amplified these criticisms. He came under non-governmental pressure to modify his, pra his practices, uh, but he did not do so. On the, on the positive side, um, the Obama administration did usher in a broadening of, defin of the definition of human rights um, that the United States paid attention to, um, really highlighting the issue of LGBTQ rights, um, uh, all, not necessarily for the first time, but giving them much greater prominence than they had previously. Now, when Trump took office on January 20th, 2017, observers expected very little from his administration's human rights policy but his administration's record ultimately exceeded this anxious speculation um, because not only was the United States largely unconcerned with the protection of human rights during his uh, internationally during his administration, but the observance of human rights in the United States was undermined in many ways. Um, and the administration was beginning to lay a foundation for drastically revising American human rights commitments if the president had won a second term. Now the president's assaults on the press efforts at voter suppression, forced family separation at the border, indefinite detention of children, limits on travel from majority Muslim countries, and drastic decreases of refugee admissions flouted longstanding American practices and policies. And upon taking office, Biden and his aides sent a number of early signals about how his approach to human rights would differ from his predecessors and to fulfill the campaign promise that I mentioned at the outset. Um, so number one, the Biden administration ended the ban on immigration from largely Muslim countries. It overturned the prohibition on transgender people serving in the US military. It established a White House Gender Policy Council. It issued an executive order that prioritized racial equity in the federal government. It allowed the Director of National Intelligence to release the US uh, intelligent community's determination that Saudi Crown Prince um, Mohammed bin Salman was responsible for the murder of US resident and Washington Post journalist um, Jamal Khashoggi. Um, also, he made a speech at the State Department in February of 2021 that outlined the US commitment to diplomacy and human rights. And in this speech, Biden declared, quote, we must start with diplomacy rooted in America's most cherished diplomatic values, defending freedom, championing opportunity, upholding universal rights, respecting the rule of law, and treating every person with dignity. Specifically, Biden spoke out about the military coup in Burma, the politically motivated repression of Russian dissident uh, Alex Navalny, China's record on human rights, and the war in Yemen. And similarly, his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, used a March 2021 appearance at the unveiling of the 2020 annual still in effect um, human rights country reports to draw a sharp distinction between the Trump and Biden administration's approaches. 
Biden declared, quote, standing for people's freedom and dignity honors America's most sacred values. And furthermore, he went on to acknowledge the deficits in the United States' own record of human rights and pledged to address them with full transparency. Finally, he signaled that the Biden administration intended to resume working with the United Nations Human Rights Council, with Congress, and with civil society to advance human rights. And several months later, in July of 2021, Biden and Blinken announced that the United States was opening up its record on human rights to UN scrutiny, inviting both the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism and the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues to visit the United States. And they signaled that they would welcome other UN human rights experts as well. Um, and I would say that you know, going all the way back to Senator Bricker, this engagement with the United Nations on human rights would have been unimaginable in early eras. So it really represents something new. In addition, Blinken sent a cable to all US embassies outlining the means by which they could advance human rights internationally. Blinken wrote, quote, standing up for democracy and human rights everywhere is not in tension with America's national interests, nor with our national security. It is squarely in America's national interests and strengthens our national security when democracy and human rights are protected and reinforced worldwide. And again, this is something that is new here. It's not just a shift from the Trump administration, but from many of the Cold War era presidents that preceded him. Um, because here what the Biden administration is saying is that human rights always aligns with, rather than generally or even potentially conflicts with, US foreign policy objectives. In October 2021, the United States rejoined the UN's Human Rights Council, winning an election to a three-year term. Um, and in the following months, the Biden administration continued to demonstrate a commitment to human rights through rhetoric, policy, and action. Just to give another example, um, in December of 2021, the Biden administration hosted uh, the, uh, virtually uh, the Summit for Democracy. And I would say that these steps, the re-engagement with the UN, hosting an international summit for democracy, all signal a much more multilateral approach to US support for human rights than we've seen in any of the previous administrations. Now, furthermore, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, the United States, as you know, um, along with its allies, has been supporting Ukraine militarily. But it's also engaged on human rights issues in the country, and it's pressed for Russia's remo removal from the UN Human Rights Council. So to conclude, I think that examining US attention to human rights in its foreign policy since the 1940s demonstrates a sort of slow growing consideration of the issue. But this general trend is really marked by ups and downs, back and forth, um, and the moments in which we see greater attention to human rights, as you know, I argue, is because of external pressure, pressure from members of Congress, non-governmental organizations, and concerned citizens about these issues. So given these demands, this external pressure, US presidents and their aides had to evaluate human rights cons considerations when they made decisions about foreign assistance, should aid be given to Argentina or not, um, rhetorical support or condemnation, should we praise the Shah of Iran or not, um, or forceful actions such as military intervention. So before US administrations had not taken human rights into consideration, under press, external pressure, they began to have to at least think about these issues. Um, but I've sh as I've shown, even if they started to think about human rights issues much more, the US government rarely prioritized human rights unless doing so aligned with its other policy objectives. And for that reason, I think that the rhetoric and policies of the Biden administration and of his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, suggest that it may be adopting a new approach to human rights in terms of both why and how the US considers human rights. Now certainly it's, it's too soon to tell um, if this might usher in a fundamentally new place for human rights um, at the center or elsewhere of US foreign policy. But as a historian who's been studying these issues for a long time, I'm quite interested in what, what might come out of this new approach. So thank you all very much. I know Dr. Snyder was very interested in addressing questions that the crowd, the audience might have. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'd like to bring the microphone over to you so we can make sure we can get it on the, uh, the video. <laughs> 
Yes, so you briefly mentioned sanctions as a means of sort of ensuring human rights by the United States, though I understand that sanctions are a very controversial measure of determining human rights. I've heard some people say that sanctions only affect sort of the lowest kind of class of people in a country while the higher class does the sort of benefits from it. And then others have said that sanctions are the, one of the more non-invasive measures the United States has of ensuring that sort of human rights abuses do not occur. So could I sort of get your opinion on how you think sanctions are or should be utilized as a means of ensuring human rights? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and the debates about sanctions are kind of constantly coming up again and again. And we've seen this in particular in the wake of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So there's a few things that I would say about sanctions. One is that they're potentially um, only useful in some instances. So for example, um, in Cambodia in the 1970s, there was a massive genocide, but that government had completely isolated itself from almost the entire rest of the world. And so there were very few measures that, you know, say the government of France might have been able to take as a sanction against the Cambodian government to prevent that genocide from continuing. So you do have to have um, sort of a relationship in which the sanctions can be deployed. Two, you know, I think that you, are right to say that in some instances, the people who are targeted through sanctions might not be the political leaders who are uh, make, taking these policies. And in fact, the people of that country might not support those leaders at all, but nonetheless, they are suffering under sanctions regimes. And that's one of the reasons that, for example, with the Harkin Amendment, there was an exception that they weren't gonna cut off economic assistance if the real victims of that legislation would be the quote needy people of that country. So it's certainly something that American policymakers have thought a lot about. I'm not sure that they always get the balance right there, um, but it is an issue that I think gets a lot of attention. Um, there's a lot of debate about if sanctions work. Um, political scientists have a lot of, uh, are doing a lot of research on this. And I, I am not sure that we can show that they do actually change the practices of a foreign government. Many of the um, activists that I've written about in my book, and particularly uh, in the second book, you know, they say, you know, we, we can't necessarily overthrow or you know, push the junta in Argentina out of power, but what we can do is ensure that if they're targeting their citizens, they're not doing it with American-made tanks or American-made helmets or American-made tear gas. And so for them, the cutting off of security assistance means at least the United States is no longer complicit in those human rights violations, even if it might not lead to the end of that repressive government. So it's potentially might only be a half measure, but it means that the United States government is at least kind of on the right side of history there. So that's multiple answers that only kind of answered your question, but that's what I have. No, thank you so much. Yep. Another question? Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm interested in what you think about uh, the intervention in Libya. Uh, on the one hand, it was an um, example of multilateral um, action uh, through international law uh, to prevent uh, what could have been really severe human rights abuses. But on, and in a way, it was successful in, in preventing those abuses, but then it's often these days seen as a failure or it backfired it um, some people see as overreach um, so so what do you, do you think that was an example of, of a human rights uh, foreign policy that had some success so I will begin by saying I'm a historian uh, and the intervention in Libya under the Obama administration is too soon to tell from a historical perspective um, but I agree that, so I think there's sort of, there's multiple things here. One is that there's a decision about should the United States do anything or not? If the United States believes that um, its national security or other interests might be affected by inaction, it has to decide then what to do. And I think too often the debate about what to do is um, flattened such that the only answer that people believe is that the United States has to put boots on the ground. And obviously, whether it's sanctions or other measures, there's a whole range of things that the United States can do short of intervening militarily. But I think a lot of the recent interventions, whether it's in 
Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya have shown that um, you can't predict what is going to come next. And, you know, that's what people like Nixon and Kissinger were always warning against. You don't know who will come next. They might be worse. I don't think that the fact that some um, efforts to prevent gross violations of human rights taking place didn't work out as you know, the greatest optimist might have hoped doesn't mean that the United States shouldn't consider future actions. Um, but I think it does show that, and this is where I think um, the Biden administration's approach of sort of adopting a much more multilateral approach is appropriate. I think it shows that the United States um, does not have all of the answers. It needs to work with a whole range of allies to have a successful um, and effective foreign policy. And, you know, I think Libya might be one case um, in which, uh, you know, what was the United States doing there, leading from behind? You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that that was, was an effective strategy. But I don't think that what we should take away from that case is that, oh, the United States should never do anything ever when it's confronted with massive human rights violations. So do you think that putting human rights at the center of its foreign policy kind of risks um, the United States violating state sovereignty like it did in Iraq um, just because, you know, with domestic humanitarian crises kind of um, defying the rule of law set by the UN, do you think that that poses a risk to another um, Iraq precedent that the United States had in 2003? So absolutely, putting human rights at the center of anyone's foreign policy runs the risk of violating state sovereignty. Um, and this was the argument kind of up until the 1970s, that human rights are um, an internal concern for governments to focus on. Um, and so the United States shouldn't criticize a foreign government's record, and foreign governments shouldn't criticize the United States. And the innovation of things like a universal declaration of human rights is supposed to be that the human rights record of any country should be open to scrutiny because all individuals, regardless of where they live, should be able to have their rights fulfilled. And so I think what people are saying if they support a kind of universal um, and indivisible um, understanding of human rights is that ceding some state sovereignty is the price that we have to pay for greater respect for human rights internationally. And we are willing to accept that. Now, the United States has not been willing to accept that for much of its history. Um, you know, it has not been willing to let in people like the UN Special Rapporteurs that I was talking about. It has not wanted there to be scrutiny of its record of racial discrimination or a whole host of social and economic issues. And so I do think that that's one thing that is potentially different now is uh, a greater willingness to recognize that if you want to lead on human rights, you have to subject your own record to greater scrutiny. Um, and I think there is, it seems to me there's a bit more humility with things like the Summit for Democracy and saying like, you know, we've been a democracy since 1776, but we've clearly got some parts of it not yet perfected. And we all should be working together on democracy promotion and strengthening democracy. Um, and so I do think that there's a willingness to say cede some sovereignty in order to have greater respect for human rights. Good questions. Another question. I have a question, or I have a comment. I'm not sure it's a question, but it, it has a question. I'm deeply persuaded by your argument that uh, the United States pursues um, human rights until it's strategic interests intervene, or e conflict. Um, has there been a time in your, in your, that you can think of that the United States has ever pursued human rights that don't uh, mostly align with their strategic interests or their, their selfish interests? I would say that if we disaggregate the United States and we think about there being multiple actors in the US government, that there have been, whether it's the ambassador, you know, that was a, an ambassador to Chile, um, who was told to cut out the political science lectures, or members of Congress, or um, people at the sort of assistant secretary of human rights level at the State Department, that they have pursued and championed human rights issues, even if 
it may not have been in the kind of broader strategic Cold War interests. But there have not been as many instances of the U.S. president who, you know, to be frank, they, they have a lot of interests that they have to be thinking about. They are not just the human rights president. They are the president of a whole host of other issues. Um, and so there have not been um, instances where I think that there has been a sort of wholehearted push um, for human rights, even when the costs of that were recognized um, and the issue was pushed forward. I think you see lower level actors pushing the issue. Um, and that, that can be effective, right? You know, you don't necessarily need the Secretary of State to something, say something if the ambassador is on the ground pushing the issue again and again. Um, and there, I definitely have a lot of evidence of people who are, you know, even in the Kissinger uh, State Department, who are on the ground pushing human rights issues and protecting and saving the lives of, of key political dissidents through kind of maverick individual efforts. So there's some reason to be optimistic or happy. Uh, I mean, I... <laughs> Um, I, I think that there is reason to be optimistic about the policy of the current president and secretary of state. Um, I think things like putting Samantha Power, a, a champion of human rights, as a head of US um, AID suggests that they're thinking about human rights in terms of social and economic rights. Um, I think there are many things to be optimistic about. But if we talk about the state of human rights in the world today, um, you know, it's depressing. Every corner of the world, um, there, are, you know, we. I don't think we can say, there, you know, there's a moment right after the end of the Cold War where you see the collapse of communism in Europe, the end of apartheid in South Africa. There's so much optimism about this new world order um, in which rights are gonna be recognized, people are gonna participate fully in their government, they are gonna have access to the benefits of globalization, and um, I don't think it is only September 11th, but um, you know that seems much more like a sort of lost opportunity or a, a fleeting moment than many commentators on US foreign policy at the time believed it to be. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think, uh, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I think everyone would like to uh, give a round of applause. And thanks everyone for coming. This is, uh, I, I failed to mention earlier, this is an annual lecture that we have which recognizes, um, well, which focuses on genocide and human rights and it's, it's it's given in honor of a professor who graduated, or graduated, retired many, many years ago, Robert Kragelot, um, and one of his students, Peter Kakel, who unfortunately wasn't able to come today, uh, generously endowed this lecture series. So every year we, we return to the questions of human rights and genocide, um, and, uh, and we have uh, an OWU alum, Peter Kakel, to thank for that. So anyway, again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Go study and do whatever else you are supposed to be doing.